Hey guys, uh, so we got to the end of recording this video and realized that we never mentioned this video does not contain any welding. This is only reviewing this machine and its features. So if you're looking at buying a welder, this is the video to watch. If you just wanted to see a laser welding, yeah, this is the wrong video. Otherwise, uh, enjoy the rest of the video. Hey guys, we are back with another laser review. This time, this one is in our shop. This is a laser welder. Uh, this was sold to us or imported by uh, Bezcutter. That stands for Business Equipment Solutions. Uh, we did receive a small discount on the machine for doing this video and because this is the first of its kind being imported by Bezcutter and we were offered to be the, uh, the first testers for it. Uh, this all started about nine months ago. We needed a laser welder for a product that we were building and I contacted him. Uh, he didn't have any welders on the, the site at the time. And I asked him, hey, can you import an ND Yag uh, three axis laser? And he says, well, since the last time you purchased a, a cutter, fiber laser technology has come down a lot in price. We could actually do the same machine in a fiber welder instead of an ND Yag, which would be faster and better. And I said, well, absolutely. And he told me that they offered a handheld and a robot. And I asked him, well, can you instead make that more like your laser cutter with a welding head? And he said he'd make some phone calls. Two weeks later, he came back to me with this exact machine. So they followed through really well on their company name of being the business equipment solution. So we're gonna look into this machine. We're going to try to cover some of the things so if you are looking for a machine, you know the correct questions to ask so that you get the exact machine that you need. Uh, this machine is fairly cost effective. Uh, I'm just a small shop. We only have three guys. We only have a total of about 2,000 square foot of building here. We are a small shop. And lasers are now obtainable even to us smaller factories and not just the large scale automotive manufacturers. We can now afford these. So we're gonna take a look at this uh, uh, machine from different sides and show you more about it. So here we are at the uh, the front of the machine. The machine dimensions that you're going to need, uh, you're going to need about seven feet to the top of the door. I can't think of a reason why your ceiling would be shorter than this other than if you're using uh, mezzanine in some kind of factory setting. Um, but otherwise you need seven feet so that way the door fully opens. Uh, you need about a six and a half foot doorway to get the machine into your building. Again, I don't know why you would have a door that short, so you should be fine. Um, the depth of the machine is 50 inches from the back of the machine to the front or to the door handles. Uh, the width is 44 from this side to the other side. And there's also a screen on the left side that pivots that you'll need to, to have enough space for. Uh, your power requirements, uh, this draws about 25 amps. Uh, I believe that's at full load um, on the 240 volt American side of the buck transformer. Uh, so that's gonna require at least a 30 amp breaker, if not a little bit larger, talk to your electrician for hooking the machine up. It's not that much power. This unit is single phase, so you can run it anywhere in the US. Um, this is very versatile. I, at the time I purchased this, the 750 watt unit uh, was the biggest that they could go on single phase. That may have changed now. I have been seeing some 1000 watt units handheld that are single phase, so that might be possible now. Um, as I've already mentioned, the output is 750 watts. That does allow you to weld quite a bit. I do really thin material, so that's all I needed. If you're welding thicker, then obviously talk to your uh, manufacturer and they'll talk to the factory and get the right size machine for you. Uh, the machine construction, the safety panels, I really like the way that they're made. Uh, it has very large openings for doing maintenance and for being able to set up the table. Uh, it has these very large access panels on both sides as well as the back. In fact, um, there's only a small corner piece, about five or six inches, uh, and the rest of it is service panel. These lower panels can be removed with screws, although I haven't found that to be necessary. Um, the side panels are removed with a key that kind of looks like a, a, an old clock key. Very simple to remove. They're not super specialized, uh, so that way you can access the inside of the machine. Uh, the door on this 
Uh, if you saw my laser cutter review, that machine had a spring loaded, kind of like a garage door spring to lift the door. This one's actually counterbalanced. And I know this seems like a silly thing to, to be this focused on the door, but if the door is bad, it doesn't matter how good the machine is, you guys are gonna hate running it. This one, single single finger to lift and lower the door it's the same way all through the motion because there's a weight in the back of the machine that weighs almost exactly the same as the door so that way it the door just kind of floats um, so that's a really nice touch and uh, when you're opening and closing this door 100 times a day uh, that does make a big difference the other just subtle thing that they did that's very nice is they use the uh, the better switches uh, it's just, I've used some of the cheap switches, uh, and these are definitely the, the nicer ones. They're not quite an Allen Bradley, but uh, they're, they're nice. All right, so we're going to move on to the next side. All right, so now we're still at the front of the machine. Uh, I wanted to just show you, uh, this does look like it's really short, but as soon as you sit down, the keyboard and mouse that are in this pull-out tray are actually at just about the right height and it puts the uh, parts also at a very comfortable working height. Now if you wanted this taller, this does have about four inches of upward adjustment. The reason I have it set here is uh, the machine is underneath my shop air filter. Um, so I'm kind of limited on my height. I would probably bring it up an inch if I could. The Over here is the software that you'll be using. Uh, in the base of the machine there is a computer, just this normal desktop computer, and here it uses Windows and the software is WSX 2019. You just open it up like a, any app on a uh, Windows computer. I'm going to cover programming uh, the machine in a separate video because otherwise this video is going to be way too long. Up here uh, what this is, this screen is looking at a camera that actually is looking directly down the beam. Um, it's not pointing in from the side. It's actually, there's a reflector in here that reflects visible light up and into the camera but allows the invisible beam to pass through it. So this is actually looking directly down the path of the welding beam, which is pretty wild. Um, the crosshairs are adjustable up on the camera itself. There's two knobs on the back so you can adjust your crosshairs to hit exactly where your, uh, um, uh, right where your laser hits, so that's adjustable. And you'll use this for finding, you can either program the machine um, weld joints using the camera or you can just locate the parts. Uh, you'll use this as kind of a probing system. Um, we'll cover that in another video. Uh, again, because otherwise this is going to be too long. So let's jump over and look at the inside of the machine. So now we're uh, on the inside of the machine. Uh, obviously we have the access panel removed so we can look inside. Uh, the welding head that is being used appears to be made by WSX Lasers. Uh, they manufacture uh, welding and cutting heads as well as the software that this machine is operating on. This appears to be an ND10 welding head, which is their small welding head that is their pretty much their most base model welding head. It has an air knife underneath, which you will need compressed air um, that is dry and clean to properly operate, or you can use bottled gas. It also has a separate solenoid for argon gas that's more in the base of the machine than on the head, but um, uh, used for shielding. There, the original machine came with these copper tubes that are on this uh, mechanism that screws in here that will hold your shielding gas such as argon or nitrogen. Uh, we added these hoses and honestly the original copper ones worked better. We ended up finding a recipe that welded our material with no shielding gas so that was much cheaper uh, so we end up just bending these kind of out of the way to, to keep them away but these plastic hoses did not really work. Uh, questions you'll want to ask when you're ordering your machine, if you are doing any kind of wider gap fill, you might want to look into a welding head. WSX also manufactures those such as the ND24. Um, the software can control the wobble profile. I believe it's using a Galvo type head, sort of like those um, uh, engraving machines that can race around and weld 
uh, can engrave any shape in seconds. I assume it's uh, similar technology to that. Um, so that, that's going to be something you're going to want to ask about as a wobble head if you have wider gap fill. And they also, in the software, have the ability to control a wire feeder. I didn't even know such a thing existed when I was ordering this unit. Um, it might be a nice add-on if you're ever going to do wide gap fill or if you need to make a fillet of weld material in corners. It would basically make this machine replace um, wire feed type welders like MIG welders. Uh, so you could actually do larger filling uh, jobs. Uh, up here, this is all part of the head from here down. The camera is separate. The only thing specialized, well, it's a bit of a specialized camera in that you have adjustable knobs for the crosshairs. Um, that's a little bit specialized. The camera is not connected to the computer in any way that we can see. It appears to only be for uh, targeting. This, uh, I think this is a BNC cable, goes directly to the screen and it just has a little power cord to operate the camera. Otherwise, the software can't see the camera. It's only for the operator use. Now, a few things that we have changed on this machine from original uh, when it came in, it did not have this um, cable raceway, this, this um, what do they call this stuff, drag chain. Uh, it did not come with this. It came with a much smaller one that was for the hoses and for the cables that run the servos and the, the camera equipment on this machine, um, which was fine and adequate for that, but the fiber optic ran in a separate tube, kind of like, you know, it was actually this stuff here, and it ran from the side and kind of flexed over the top. Now that gives you a lot more control. You can tilt the head. The head has a, a uh, pivot here so you can turn it on an angle in this axis. It's manual. It doesn't have any servos or anything. You loosen it, you turn it to whatever angle you want, and you tighten it. And that'd be good for welding inside. And that type of system would give you the flexibility to turn that. Now we only weld straight down. So we decided to go ahead and add uh, this um, 200 millimeter radius um, flexible cable conduit or drag chain they might also call it. So we added that. We had to add this bracket to support it up higher than the original one was. And we added this bracket to support all the cables coming out here to maintain all the radiuses proper for the uh, fiber optic line. I imagine that in the future the company that puts this unit together will probably add that because that is a much better, more rigid way of supporting everything to keep it safe and protected. Uh, however, at this moment, uh, I don't believe they do, but again, in the future, they'll probably change that. Uh, another thing that we added is this auto oiler system. Uh, originally, you would just connect a, an oil gun to it. You had a little Zerk fitting that you'd squeeze oil into the linear glides. Uh, that's fine for smaller, shorter run stuff. When we operate our machine, uh, we'll run it 12 hours a day, six days straight. Uh, and that'll be a typical production run. And we'll do that a couple, um, every month or so. So because of the hard use, we wanted to add oilers on it so that way we keep everything lubricated and we don't have to stop to, to oil anything. As far as the machine build quality, uh, this machine is rock solid. Um, the table is about 5 eighths thick aluminum, probably about 16 millimeter. Uh, it's all one big plate. The gantry, these beams here, these vertical columns, um, this is an aluminum extrusion that has been machined to what looks like really tight tolerances. It's very good work on this. The cross beam is also an extrusion. It's the C shape with a center rib and then more cross ribbing in between. It's really thick, very overbuilt. The inside of it is machined very cleanly. The component that connects uh, the slide axis to the vertical axis. This is a solid aluminum block that's all been machined very clean. Uh, we have linear glides, uh, ball bearing feed screws, so these won't lose precision over time. Not very much. We're talking maybe a ten thousandth of an inch um, over a year or so of running. So, and all of the glides are built like this. So the uh, X, Y, and Z axis 
the Z and X axes are these pre-assembled units that are fairly mass produced, which is a very good way of um, uh, saving costs versus building a custom mount. But this is a great way to do it. It puts your linear um, guides, glides, as well as your ball bearings and your servo all together in one produced piece that um, saves a lot of costs, ups your precision, and makes the, the factory assembly of these machines much simpler. Uh, so that reduces any mistakes that could be made. And it also makes it so you can purchase this component. I have found these online for fair, for only a couple hundred bucks. Uh, so if you need replacement parts in the future, it's a it's an awesome way to build a machine. The control is done by a stepper motor. Uh, I'm not sure of the size of this. I think it's a pretty decent way of running it. The other option would be servos, but steppers work great in this application. Um, the only trouble I have had with the Z-axis, it might have been that the stepper needs to be just a little larger, uh, or there needs to be some kind of counterbalance spring. I think there's too much weight. Um, occasionally when you home the machine, it tries to go a little too fast and Z-axis actually drops the, uh, the stepper teeth are slipping. Now it's not damaging, damaging anything. It's not like gear teeth where they're getting broken. They're electronic teeth. Um, there's no damage done to the, to the mechanism. Uh, it just goes the wrong way. You just have to stop the machine and restart it and it usually works the second time, no problem. Um, just something to be aware of and I can show you that in the software. I'll, I'll show you that in a, the next video. Another thing being that this is somewhat of the most basic you can make the machine, uh, thereby also the uh, most cost effective, the way you adjust the laser dot size, uh, this doesn't have much in the way of adjustment. Uh, there is a small adjustment similar to the laser cutting units where it'll move the uh, focal point up and down a little bit, but most of the way you do it uh, there's actually a camera adjustment. I don't remember which knob it is. One of these knobs adjusts the focus. The other one adjusts how much light comes in the aperture. Uh, if you adjust the focus, um, you're going to move the Z-axis to a different position for getting correct focus on your part, which is how you usually set your Z-axis height. Uh, if you change the focus, you'll change the height, which changes the dot size. Um, so then when you change heights on parts, you'll just refocus the camera by moving the Z-axis. And again, your dot size will stay consistent with whatever you set up. So that's how that is done. Another thing on this machine, uh, it works perfect for us. Uh, our part height is really short, and that was one of the questions that the factory asked. Uh, the mechanism on my machine, the Z-axis, the front of this uh, mechanism can about touch the table, um, but most of your welding is going to be done with the front of this almost 100 millimeters off of your part. So had this been moved up another 100 millimeters, we could have got a little bit more height. It's not a problem for me, uh, but it's definitely something to mention what your part height you're expecting to be is. That way the factory can make sure they get the enough height uh, for what you're working on. Uh, this is what's underneath all the covers on the axes. Uh, this is either an optical or some kind of magnetic switch. Uh, there's a small plate of what appears to be aluminum that will pass between them. And when it passes between them, it will stop the axis from moving. So if you randomly have an axis that won't travel as far as it once did, maybe that one of these sensors moved. And you can also adjust these sensors if you have, say, added a lubrication system and didn't take into account how far the axis moves upward. You can move it down a little bit like we may have done. Now, another thing that I believe I mentioned at the beginning of the video is that this we have been using this machine quite a bit. We've welded uh, over or pretty close to half a mile or 2,400 feet of weld. Uh, this does not make nearly as much smoke as like a laser cutter, if you're familiar with one of those. Uh, they make an enormous amount of slag and dust um, that really makes a mess of your machine. This one barely makes uh, any smoke. Um, we're actually looking at doing a new extraction system. Uh, we just picked this up from Amazon. Uh, it's two and a half inch lock line. Um, and we're gonna mount it in here to draw the smoke off of the weld directly. That way we don't even have to draw the smoke out of the entire box. We'll just draw it right off of the weld. Another thing is the um, cooler is the only thing that's 
you haven't seen, it's the same as the one in my uh, laser cutting review video. I've actually placed it in the other room in my uh, air compressor room because that's not a conditioned space. So that way any of the heat created by generating the laser, I actually eject it out of my air conditioned shop and into a non-conditioned space. So that's by not having that built in, it's a, a fantastic way of doing that, is just putting it outside of your conditioned workspace. So here's the table that ours came with. These are drilled and tapped, uh, 50 millimeters on center. There's 12 by 12 bolts. Uh, the table itself is about 600 millimeters square. Uh, the holes are tapped for a six millimeter coarse thread, it's the common coarse thread, I forgot what pitch it is. Uh, the way we're doing our parts, uh, we do very small parts, this fits about five components uh, on these trays, and then we slide them into this kind of double H cutout that we made on our laser cutter, which is a great companion for this machine. The one other thing I wanted to mention is on our machine, and this probably happened in transit, is our um, Y axis does not is not quite square with our x-axis. Uh, I'm taking this apart to add an auto oiler in here anyway, so while I'm in there, I'm gonna go ahead and bump this around. It's off 0.8 millimeter um, across the entire 600 millimeter table. That would not be a problem if you're manually programming because even if you're welding a square, it's just gonna look like a diamond on the uh, software. It wouldn't be a big deal, but where it becomes a problem is when you're recycling your drawing. Like if you, like in my case, I'm doing a left and right side that are symmetrical. I don't get to copy and mirror the image because it's skewed the opposite direction. Uh, just something to pay attention to. I bought a machinist square just to test it. It's always a good idea to have these uh, kind of tools around. It may be possible to re-square it in the software, but I'm gonna do it in the hardware because I'm gonna be there anyway. Uh, not a big deal, just something to pay attention to. So you made it to the end of the video. Uh, I guess to kind of conclude and summarize this, would I buy this machine again? Absolutely. If something happened to my shop and I lost this machine, I would replace it. Now, would I change anything? I would probably try to get a little bit more out of everything. I might lean toward a thousand watt unit, though I haven't really needed it because I think they're available now. Uh, another thing I might look at is a wobble head. It probably is gonna add about five grand to the machine, but it would increase versatility quite a bit. Though, I don't use one now and it does work. And a wire feeder too would be another option I would uh, strongly consider. So, um, would I recommend this machine? Uh, to most people, yes. However, with a little warning. This machine is a lot more complicated to run than most of the other machines I have operated. Uh, not from the machine programming standpoint, that's actually very straightforward. This is a simple 2D drawing. It's easy to draw, you can import it as a DXF. It's fantastic for that. The problem is there are, even on this very basic machine, there's five different parameters uh, at least that you can control. You can control your dot size with the height. You can control your feed rate. You can control power, pulse width modulation, and pulse width duration. And every one of those factors is going to control how your weld is going to uh, come out. Uh, and on top of that, you also have ramp up, ramp down, um, you have different start stop um, procedures that you can do. Uh, it does add a lot of complexity. Uh, I know myself, I'm pretty good at running uh, laser cutters. It took me maybe an hour to get a new program for that. And this one took me three days before I even got a decent weld. Another three days of fiddling, and then I had a really good weld. The machine can do it, but it's complicated to program. Once you got it though, you can lay down thousands of welds. Uh, I think in my first batch, I did about 36,000 small welds in about four days. Fantastic, very happy with it. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, we're gonna cover programming in a separate video because uh, that's gonna take 10 or 20 minutes to give you an overview of the software. And I'm gonna try to give you as many tips and tricks as I can to give you a good weld on as close to your first attempt as possible. Uh, if you liked the video, subscribe, because we're gonna have more content. If you have a laser cutter or welder, definitely subscribe. Uh, give us a thumbs up. I mean, it doesn't do anything. We're not a monetized channel, but it is nice to see that thumbs up, if you can give it to us. 
Um, outside of that, thanks for watching and uh, stay tuned to future content.